Hi, this is Privateer Station, and as news of the Crimean Bridge destruction run around the world, we are bringing you a conversation between Alexei and Mark that happened just a few hours before that. So stay tuned, uh, we'll, I'm sure they'll touch on that later today. For now, day 226, with Alexei Rostovich, Lieutenant Colonel, Advisor to the Office of the President of Ukraine, and Mark Fagan, Russian Opposition Journalist. Enjoy. Dear friends, glad to see you all on Fagin Live. It is Friday, October 7th. Time is 3 minutes past 10 in Kiev and we're doing another stream with Alexei Aristovich. It is a stream titled Day 226. Good evening, glad to see you, Alexei. Oh my god, I just took a look at this map and uh, became horrified. Even when I was little, when I was reading a book of future commanders, I was not drawing maps like that. Okay, okay, we'll uh, find a, another map to show. There are over 200,000 watching us, uh, about a third of you click the like button. Please subscribe to Fagin Live to Alexei's uh, channel. And if you are listening or watching that in English, subscribe to the Privateer Station as well. We do appreciate that support. All right, so still, we have one jubilant here. We'll discuss that separately. Oh, that one? Yeah, okay. Jubilant, right. It's his anniversary. Uh, celebrations uh, in Russia. All right, but we do need to understand what's going on the south and east of Ukraine, because it is somewhat related to him, right? Okay, I'll say my sacral phrase right now. Uh, nothing is going on, because both sides are aggregating their forces, restocking, uh, whenever they will be at uh, level sufficient enough for continuation, things will ensue. So for now there are little tactical things happening, but nothing major. So both sides are shelling each other with artillery and getting reserves and ammo to the front line. I want to say that we are more successful than uh, the other side. And I think this map is drawn by Brit Brits, Americans, that's American, okay. So see that map they drawn? Uh, it's really close to Svatova now, that red line up north, uh, in the middle. See there's a little blue-ish island on the red side, uh, that's Svatova. And what's happening near Kriminaya? Ooh, things happening. We cannot comment the actual events, but let's wait for the general comment to do that. And they're usually commenting a bit later, when the flag is already installed in the center, uh, in the administration. But uh, there are a lot of maneuvers happening on the Russian side, sort of a Zerg rush uh, mode. Russia did throw some reserves onto that side. And their task is to hold the railroad junction. Uh, see that Crimea, another bluish uh, island on the map. Now it was moved towards the top uh, near Crimea. That's another important one. And uh, Lysychansk and Severodonetsk are also now a part of a second line of defense. And this is the second line of defense that they were trying to create. And that's the one they wasted their troops near Liman for trying to buy some time. So there is a road connecting Lysychansk with the northern uh, towns. Uh, there is an R66 route that was cut. Uh, see there is a blue protrusion up at the 12, so that, that uh, road was cut. And if American map is telling the truth, then we'll see who wins. Uh, it's interesting how things will unfold in that side. None of the offensive maneuvers can continue forever, so it comes to a stall. 
what we need to bring more reserves and sooner or later each of them completes and then when the next one starts that depends upon the available resources all right uh bachman direction there is nothing no movement there for about a month they are literally just killing themselves over our defense lines i verify re-verified again today they're not moving even a meter a day they're just destroying themselves, similar like uh, Nyerjev in the Second World War, where the uh, Soviet Union wasted 1.2 million people. There is a, a literary thing, I think, uh, about that battle Nyerjev, where I think Aksyonov maybe, uh, they were basically layering the fields with uh, Red Army soldiers, 1.2, 1.5 million were wasted there and perished during the stupid operation in three months just because they wanted to take certain heights and they sent that many troops that's similar they're just layering the field there well yeah that's uh, seems like a modus operandi for their army we've seen that before yep just uh, witnessing that um, the line from Horlivka to Marinka is a bit quieter there is a little bit of shooting there, some random attempts with small storm actions and useless directions. But there, there is not much action there, because most active troops are thrown up towards Bakhmut or to Kriminaya up north. Uh, near Marinka, they also try to portray some activity. Uh, a little further they are showing some Ukrainian troops pushing through but um, they, they are drawing that blue island here trying to show that we are indicating some move towards Mariupol and uh, in reality there is not too much happening they have some troops here which uh, are only engaging us as they need to uh, in defense they do not do anything any attacking maneuvers further along the line there is an attempt to move russian reserves around but there is no it's just motion there is no active engagement so if we go further to Kherson, here we see the piece we cut along the river all the way down to david broad there is a lot of motion near Snigirovka. That's another big uh, junction that uh, is similar to David Obrod and the capture of which will be a key uh, element for this operation. This is the remaining uh, protrusion of Russian red line up north on this map towards uh, 12. So overall, there chunk of occupied land as uh, elegantly shrunk okay so what's the distance between Kherson to the Ukrainian positions from Posada Pakrovska I think it's about 30 kilometers plus minus about 25 miles um, you can already see Kherson from our lines there's a famous uh, Chernobyevka region not too far remember we posted a picture a while ago so we're at about the same position it is a good news overall because as their positions are shrinking we can start using field artillery not long range but field artillery and uh, it'll join the fight uh, and be rather successful as, uh, in destroying their targets so we'll have much more fruitful artillery engagements so see after the first initial push they managed to create a, a whole certain a second line of defense we are still pushing through and uh, only god knows how it will unfold and our general command uh, with Zaluzhny at the top and uh, they are still continuing to show us to use missiles on our cities and villages yeah they uh, there were about 200 MLRS uh, munitions uh, used in one of the cities uh, some dead people of course so they are doing the daily people are dying in Nikolaev people are dying in other towns and then cities 
we just need to mention that uh, we understand that that's what's happening. But that's the story. Um, but uh, there was another piece of news in Kostroma, on Kursk. Open sources mentioning that uh, two Tu-22 strategic bombers might be destroyed. I've only seen that in open sources, so I cannot uh, confirm or, or deny, but I'm mentioning that I've seen that in open sources. All right. 350,000 watching us live, about 100,000 click the like button. Another reminder, we've been live for about 10 minutes, it's important for us to share links to that stream everywhere you can. It is Friday, there are a lot of news uh, events worth of discussions and uh, I understand there are other things people can be doing on Friday but if you do share the streams uh, they still come and uh, watch it even if not live but later all right let's uh, not deviate too far from the south that uh, spermos of uh, that guy you I think you coined him his name his new name from spermos of um, he actually made a statement that Shoigu, Russian Minister of Defense, needs to be executed. Wow, they really pushed him to the brink. Yeah, that's what he said. Uh, he's a, uh, you know, little fella uh, moving and talking. His ass is asking for a boot. But uh, I understand he's not on, him, on his own volition mentioning and making these statements. I think somebody uh, made him say that. And it's a common trend now to attack Shoigu, so go ahead and attack uh, him that he's uh, from Tuva uh, nation, he's not exactly Russian, so use that in your speech and, you know, that's their typical modus operandi in Russia. They pay attention to these things. And by the way, Kadyrov is now elevated to general, colonel general, and uh, you're still just a lieutenant colonel. See, some people are really making their career while you're here with me talking. Um, it's interesting, the uh, talks some of these people are posting and the way they are starting to fight in the media on the Russian side reminds me of our Facebook squabbles in Ukraine. But in Ukraine we got years of practice. There is a lot of uh, offensive, counter-offensive and uh, pretty eloquent posts. Over there it seems like a kindergarten. And, you know, the way people organize their country matches the way their national character works. And uh, as national character improves, the country also is improving. They, unfortunately, lack our level of uh, sophistication. They're just uh, going forward with very simple and crude attempts. So the best way to break Putin's regime is to teach them how we do things, and they will eventually start breaking the system. Um, we are doing our best, but look, Konoshenko continues to post things and state things. Uh, he has nothing changed, is now saying that uh, they are successful in their defense operations, without even mentioning that they somehow switch from offense to defense. And uh, yeah, they're mentioning a lot, there's a lot of shit falling on his head, they're, yeah, they're asking for different actions to be done with uh, broomsticks and his uh, rear end. But um, just note, note Mark, that, that is my minor, that's minutia. They're already talking about success in defense operations. So they did switch from offensive. And now that responsibility will be flying as a hot potato between them. And that uh, Stremosov guy who is of course a fake persona, fakely posted in a fake position allows himself to bark at the Minister of Defense of Russian Federation, uh, the country that was always betting on military power, where military people were always respected, and Shoigu was a hero of Ministry of uh, extreme situations and recovery and all that. Um, he was, as, all, as long as I remember him initially, before he got to military, he was flying the helicopters, uh, saving people and he was actually he started his career with cleaning up with the cleanup of those explosions on Kashersky Chasse where which brought Putin to power and started ignited the second Chechen war 
And now some fake persona pointed here in Ukraine uh, by occupants is uh, throwing tomatoes at uh, Shoigu. Well, you should understand, he is just a little fucktard who doesn't uh, have his own opinion in this case. Oh yeah, we understand, he is being pushed to do that. But also Lapin made a few statements, the guy who faulted in Lugansk area, right, were, which allowed us to recapture and liberate some of the lands. So he joined some of that fray, some of that online squabble. And I've been uh, with these online attacks, I've been withstanding them for about eight years, so I learned some things. And I can tell, you know, successful, not successful. So that puny squeal that uh, Lapin posted, this is like a prep course for the school, not even the not even the first grade. He is posting things like, I'm ready to take a rifle and go join the fight if Kadyrov will come to the front and be a general here and go fight as well. You know, posts like that, that's our second graders post at max. Um, but he's learning, eventually he might. Pro the other problem is that his uh, psychological condition at that moment when he is making this post is not conducive to performing his main functions. So I think that condition spilling over into the social media of uh, one of the commanders of Russian operation, it will be reflecting on the situation on the front in the shortest term. That was actually noticed rather remarkably by the Minister of Defense of Ukraine, Alexei Reznik. He is uh, always timely. He published uh, another statement today appealing to officers of uh, Putin's army and saying that you've been deceived, you've been dishonored, and you're not given any means, and now you're making uh, patsies to fall for their decisions, and you will be responsible in front of parents and mothers of those who died here in Ukraine. And politicians will go out and negotiate their, and wiggle their way out, and you will be cursed, condemned, and, and killed. Yeah, that uh, reminds a book title, Cursed and Killed, Astafiev. Yep. So they do have two options, as uh, our defense minister suggested. They have an option to stay there and uh, attack those who are trying to kill you or die from them, or you can uh, turn the side, uh, cross the front line and join us. And as Reznik mentioned, time is running out. The window for these decisions is closing because the front is not going to be collapsing slowly. It will collapse with big chunks. There will come a point where it will be too late to change sides. Okay, almost 400,000 joined us. We have been a few minutes live. I still have a, a request to subscribe to our channel, to click the like button, click that bell, so you do get all the notifications, subscribe to Fagin Live, to Alexei Rostovich and to the privateer station if you are watching that in English. We also got an information that Zelensky and Putin agreed to visit summit G20 in Indonesia in November. A national publication made this post uh, referring to the ambassador of Indonesia. However, there are press service of Ukraine follow-up statements dec uh, decrying that publication saying that Zelensky did not uh, make an official decision to visit G20. I have an impression that this is important for Putin. He is the one who is trying to get to uh, the summit and to negotiate with Zelensky or meet Zelensky, even risking that uh, he might get his ass handed to him at the summit. He is still trying to get to a summit to maybe try to talk about peace. And we see a lot of his uh, subs, a lot of posts uh, in different uh, media that, uh, of course, we need to negotiate, we need to sit down and talk to Kiev, including Matvienka and uh, others. We've been ready to talk even in March, and you guys are neglecting that. We should be coming back to the peace talks. It seems like despite all the statements of the Ukrainian side, they did not understand that there is no way to negotiate at the moment. They're still pushing that this is an inhumane 
counteroffensive of Ukraine troops back on the temporary occupied territories and the ones that they annexed recently. Um, do you really think this eventuality has a chance that Putin, with his nuclear blackmail or something, that he might visit the summit, uh, see Zelensky there and somehow negotiate the ending of this uh, war? And I don't know what he'll plea that he is getting old, that he is in his 70s now. Well, let's imagine the president who is first cancelling his own word that he will not be doing negotiations, that he is cancelling decision of the National Security Council that says uh, negotiations are impossible to conduct under current circumstances. I think this is impossible. Uh, he is a human, of course, he, is, uh, he can be making mistakes, but he is, uh, uh, in, it's not in his character to withdraw the word that he has given. For what? For the strategy of isolation of Putin to be to fail? No. Let's uh, and as as we stated, if you do want to negotiate anything with us, remove that crocodile from your top position. Nobody will be talking to Putin. The, I agree with that. That's a good position. And yeah, why would he all of a sudden change uh, what uh, what he was stating all these months? And they would be pushing in the media all these different options. Um, they're creating a media event, and many people are running uh, too fast. Some leaders who could be intermediaries uh, that they're hinting at, they almost agreed or maybe would agree or will be at the same locale and they would create a opportunity for discussion. Um, they're failing to do that on the diplomatic level, so they're pushing that into media that creates a space for commentary and then commentary upon commentary and, you know, at some point it's like, why do we comment each other, let's just meet in person and do that. I, I see what they're doing, but I don't think that'll fly. I don't think that'll work for them. All right, there is another aspect here. Same nuclear threat and dancing around it of all kinds. It is in the thing that overall, after Biden's statement that he's uh, serious, he's taking Putin's threats seriously, he knows him rather well and understands him rather well that Putin can use, uh, has potential to use nuclear weapons. And around Zelensky's uh, counter statement, let's just hit their nukes first, if they're trying to do that. So there is some media discussion happening around Zelensky counter statement as a reaction. I have a question to you in this regard. In applying to NATO and uh, Maybe that will happen uh, at some point uh, in Prague next year. The threat does not disappear and uh, you can cancel it either by closing, uh, protecting Ukraine and joining it to NATO, protecting it with a NATO umbrella, or give Ukraine tactical nukes so they can counter back. Basically, why would Moscow use nukes in, if Ukraine would have a couple of nuclear missiles as well. I don't know what the reaction would be in states, but Britons are rather quiet in commenting that. If you are, if we're addressing that eventuality, do you think that may happen? I don't think they'll ever go that route, Mark. In their worldview, giving nukes to Ukraine is irresponsible behavior. And in your view? Uh, of course, I don't think that it's irresponsible, but uh, discussing their paradigm, I think it looks like this. If we are to use nukes, we'll use it ourselves. We'll take full responsibility for that. And not just, like Filshinsky mentioned, that Russia gives nukes to Belarus or fires from Belarus. And then Ukraine, right, who didn't have any nukes, also countered with nuclear weapons. No, that's not in their paradigm. They would probably prefer more of a limited access 
Because if Ukraine will use nukes in return, then the strategy of denuclearizing Russia doesn't work. Because one thing, if you denuclearizing the country for one-sided use of nukes, that's understandable why is it happening. But if Ukraine starts to use that, then uh, yeah, you don't take that away, if you, then you'll have no chances to take it away from Russia. And it'll probably open a free-for-all, because if Ukraine has it, other countries would want to have it. And that it will be a motion to destroy the system of control of nuclear n weapons non-proliferation and the destruction of the nuclear club. So to say, the countries who have access to nukes, well, it will be destroyed somewhat, right, if Russia is uh, going to use any kind of nukes? Well, there are two ways. First, Russia needs to be punished, that's one option in this case, and the other, uh, everybody would want to have nukes, and that will lead to a much more different world, so... After the use of tactical nukes, the threshold will fall and everybody would likely be looking for, hey, we also want that. So, pro probable strategy here would be to limit that. That's a strategy to not uh, proliferate these weapons and to punish those who do. And the strategy, okay, let's give it to everybody. I, I think it's a bad strategy. I don't think they'll fall for that. But holding back collective West if they'll be sticking to the rules of non-proliferation, that may create an illusion with Moscow that, okay, they're playing by the rules, we don't really care, we can do whatever we want. No, Mark, uh, they'll actually get hit back, I'm sure, 101%. If they are using nukes, they'll face a tremendous blowback immediately. All right, we've been almost 30 minutes live, a little less than that. Let's switch to the anniversary boy. Um, we have a stream tomorrow, right? Yeah, we do, okay. I'll be back at my studio, so everything will be a little better. I was indeed meeting a lot of people in Europe, talking about different things. Um, we'll see what comes out of it. So today, Putin turns 70. I need to say that that was not a big celebration. Uh, frankly, there's nothing to celebrate. They're fully in the complete FUBAR situation um, and that grandpa is in an interesting milestone condition. I think he reached a milestone where everybody hates him, where he brought the world on the brink of a big conflict and Russia has not experienced such a demise in its a thousand year history because that wilderness and barbarianism having that nuclear hammer got to such a degree that they're now threatening the whole world with the consequences so he just by that will enter the history yeah we despise him yes he is a really bad human but uh, he will be in history now. I'm not against him being in history, even as a negative example. The thing I see is it's different. If he was aggressive, if he was successful in his aggression, he would get probably a title of Putin the Great, you know, the second Vladimir the Great. The first was uh, Kievan Vladimir the Great, but he entered it aggressively, unsuccessfully. This is the low point. It's the betting on military, complete blackmail of everybody around, nuclear threats, started beating up his neighbors, everybody is waiting for the results, and then you just shit your pants. And for the eighth months you keep shitting and you can't stop it. That's the worst. If he would never aspire to do that, but in this situation he accumulated all sides of despicable attitude onto his persona, in this, by the way, I liked one thing in his celebrations. I liked the present of President of Turkmenistan to Putin. Two pyramids, one from cantaloupes, another from melons, watermelons. Imagine you come out and there is a pyramid to about a third floor, it's pretty high. One pyramid of watermelons, another from cantaloupes. If somebody gifted me that, I would be thankful.
That's well, form well, form of art. Okay, yep, that's an interesting note. So let's look at it from the other angle. He is now at 70 year old milestone. There are some physical things that may be happening with the body. Usually 70 year olds are pretty in, in a pretty good health. And if you do watch your body, if you have medical support, they can run for a while. They can be active and doing things. But he came to this milestone with... of being significantly behind in his understanding the world and people around him. That he is uh, slacking. And I remember Gaddafi, back in the day when he was uh, in his 72, I think, or whenever he came out to the public, when he, there was a famous uh, event when he was preaching about Jamahiriya and his connection with the youngsters and all. Uh, and that was not even accepted by public. Gaddafi was in power for a longer time, right? He was about 40 years there. He lost that connection with new generation, young people who even the medium age, he was always proud of being able to connect with different layers of society in Libya. And Putin was also proud of his position in the same way that he was connecting with, uh, the, with 2000s, with 2010s, with 2020s. Do you think that uh, him going into the 70s is somewhat approaching the position that Gaddafi had uh, at the time of his demise. Well, I think he started falling behind at 68, not at 70. When he closed himself in a bunker because of COVID, he severed all the ties with society gradually, but he did. And uh, as for his relations with uh, young generations, if you interview young people, you know, 17, 18, even 20s, if you ask them what antagonism exists between Russia and Ukraine, these people who probably do not have much of a historic memory, they will not be able to formulate. I think maybe they can repeat some of the propaganda stuff that they regurgitate there. And remember those two uh, journalism faculty members, bloggers, uh, pro-Putin ones, who got beaten up by their peers? Uh, it does tell that a lot of youngsters don't think so. And for many of those uh, it's uh, who did not live through the fall of USSR, they don't see what the cause of it, because there is a country, separate country Ukraine, separate country Russia. What's the beef? It's a gerontocracy, ger gerontocracy gerontophilia, I guess when the complexes of psychological issues that um, leadership that are reinforced with historic resentment became the government politics. So I would say every leader should be uh, verified with psychiatrists, uh, especially as they get uh, older and especially when they have a lot of nuances and psychological issues like the current Russian leader. Um, because otherwise they get access to nukes and um, this is a situation where I don't think anyone wants to happen, to occur. So otherwise you give them tools to figure out ways uh, and address his issues with nuclear weapons and uh, aggression around. Um, because other people in his age would be either going to a psychologist or drinking themselves slowly out of life. But uh, now we have a person who is on the in a psychotic situation, um, has access to nukes and he is putting uh, the whole world on the brink, he's threatening millions of lives. This is a wrong situation. So a lot of systems need to be changed after. A lot of uh, balance, uh, balances and checks, uh, they showed that they're futile, they're powerless. And they do need to be addressed, they need to be renewed or changed because uh, we should be looking to avoid hitting the same uh, situation again. Yeah, we were discussing that uh, uh, Russian fairy tale needle in the egg of uh, Kashei, that uh, the evil character. 
his life is that needle that needs to be broken. I think he's already dead. I think that leader is already dead. Um, it's just a matter of uh, physical end to that. But politically, he's a dead figure. I think in India they were celebrating Mahabharata yesterday, and there is a scene there when Arjuna drops his arrow on the ground and uh, says, I cannot shoot my cousins and my uncle, I grew up with them. And then Krishna describes to him that, listen, a warrior, what a warrior is, your enemy has already died, it is all decided in the skies, your task is only to bring it to this pain. So it's the same situation with Putin. Everything is decided already, and there'll be a certain eventuality that will conclude that on a physical level. So he doesn't exist no more. All right. I think 400 and... I agree with you, yeah. And I think 450,000 people watching us live. Let's not... Uh, gloom our Friday evening with continuous talks about this uh, dad uh, jubilant. I appreciate everybody who spent their time with us on Friday. Please uh, don't forget to click the like button, click the bell, share links and subscribe. Please uh, subscribe to Fagin Live, to Alexei Rostovich and to the privateer station if you are listening to that in English. And last announcement, tomorrow we have a stream with Alexei. On Sunday, Julia Latina will be visiting uh, Mark Fagan. And uh, I'll also talk with uh, Raman Kachan, the guy who made a movie uh, DMB about demobilization and uh, Downhouse, um, and he's a great editor. All right, Alexei, see you tomorrow. Goodbye.